Hello, everybody. My name is Hjörtur Smarason. I am the Managing Director for Visit Greenland. Visit Greenland is the National Tourism Board of Greenland, and we do the marketing of the country and support the development of destinations around the country. Working in the travel industry, I have, of course, traveled uh, quite extensively. I've been to well, around 70 countries in, in different continents. And uh, my favorite experiences are always the ones that are most authentical and uh, maybe most unexpected. It can be something odd, like uh, when I was invited to uh, a couple on an onion farm in Hungary and the husband uh, was a tube player and he was practicing with three of his other tube playing fellows. So we got a tube playing quarter in Hungary. Um, something really unexpected and, and authentic in a way. But I think I have to choose one favorite cultural heritage experience. And this may sound biased, but it's actually not. This, this has been absolutely my favorite. It is dog sledding in East Greenland. And just going with an Inuit hunter out on the ice with the dogs like they have been doing for thousands of years uh, into the wilderness, which is completely untouched by, by humans. It's a fascinating experience. And, and you, just, you, you enjoy the nature, you enjoy the scenery. Uh, you enjoy the silence where you hear nothing but just the sound of the dogs breathing that are running in front of you and the skis of the sled flowing over the snow. It's, it's, uh, it's my absolute favorite. Well, if we look at Greenland, it is, I think we need to put the size and the distances in perspective. It's a country of over 2 million square kilometers which is about the size of, of uh, Congo, Saudi Arabia, or Mongolia, one of the largest countries in the world, actually. 80% um, covered by snow and uh, with a population of 57,000. If we look at the East Coast, you have a coastline of 22,000 kilometers. So that's longer than from the North Pole to the South Pole, if you would stretch it out. And in that region, the longest road is six kilometers. Um, it's, the country is, is uh, divided into uh, different areas and uh, different culture, all based on the Inuit culture. So in the West, you have the, the West, West Greenlandic language. In the East, you have the East Greenlandic language, a related language, but still a different one. And you only have 3,500 people who speak it. In the North, you have an even smaller language, where it's around five to 600 people to speak, who speak it, the North Greenlandic language. You might still uh, know some of the words that come from these languages, like the word kayak or igloo or anorak. Uh, these are all words that come from Greenlandic or Inuit languages. Um, when we think about transportation, we have a country like that where no two villages are connected. And actually, we have the most isolated village in the world where the nearest village is 800 kilometers away with no roads and connections between it. When you fly between them, it's like flying from Berlin to, to London. Um, it means that, that the form of transportation is uh, uh, quite different than we used to. You still have to use the dog sled to travel and you use the frozen ice. And now climate change is threatening that because the ice is not as stable. So it is really a unique destination that is adapting to modernity in different ways than maybe most other cultural uh, societies are doing. When we think about Greenland as a destination in competition with, with other destinations, we look at the uh, countries like Iceland, Norway, Alaska, Patagonia, Antarctica as competitive destination. And when we think about okay, what is our competitive advantage, I think clearly it is the local culture and the heritage that we have there. It's this Inuit culture and the relationship people have uh, with the nature, something that they have developed throughout thousands of years the innovations they've done, uh, so they really understand how to travel into, in this environment. And we put that at the core of the branding of, of who, who uh, Greenlanders are and what you can expect to experience when you come there and uh, uh, the authenticity that you are going to experience. And just to put it into context, if we look at the polar exploration, uh, no uh, conquer of the Poles would have been possible without the knowledge of the Greenlanders. When, Paul Peer, uh, when, when Peary, Robert Peary went to the North Pole, he did so with the help of four Inuit who had the dog sleds and the clothing that you needed to get there. 
even when we look at the South Pole, where it was Scott and Almondson, Scott from the UK and Almondson from Norway, who were competing for the South Pole, uh, it was Almondson who conquered it because he used Inuit technology, dog sleds and clothing again. So this is something that the, the Greenlanders can be proud of, and it's part of the narrative that we create and how we take that knowledge and relationship with the nature into the future. We're focusing on two things when it comes to tourism in Greenland. One is adventure tourism, and the other one is sustainability. And I think it's important to realize here uh, that you can just apply sustainability with a standard definition of it. You need to really think about what the sustainability mean in the context of the destination you're working with. And when it comes to Greenland, it's an Arctic environment. But most importantly, we think about sustainability as uh, social sustainability. So how is tourism supporting the local communities? That is of essence. It's, Greenland only has a small population. And uh, we need to develop tourism for the locals, not on the locals. And I think uh, uh, that is a very, very important factor for us. We think, need to think about the flow of tourists, uh, how they go into the, the smaller communities. And we see tourism as a fantastic opportunity to uh, uh, maintain the opportunity of livelihood in the small communities, create job opportunities, uh, economic development, and uh, uh, financial incentives to carry on some of the heritage, whether it's a, it's a handcraft, uh, dog sledding, or other skills uh, that might otherwise be lost. Well, we, well, we've all been going through the pandemic together and we've had to adapt really, really fast. And uh, even though we're opening up again now, I think we're all going to have to face the reality that travel will never be the same as it was before. It's going to be different now. We're seeing different trends that are uh, emerging. And one of the things that I've been looking into is that even before COVID, we had a phenomenon that was starting because of climate change, which was fly shaming. You shouldn't fly because you were polluting the environment. Uh, you should rather drive or, or, or use other modes of transport and travel slower. We're going to see an even more demand for travel with purpose. You know, you need a bigger reason to go to justify where you're going, uh, because now it's not just environment and also the risk of disease. So I think every destination developer has to think about this. How can we uh, develop tourism so it's more slow travel, it's more sustainable, and it has a bigger purpose. So the traveler is contributing to the local economy, to the local environment and the local culture and to the, to the self-development of the tourist. So this is an element I think everyone should think about post-COVID in their product development.